Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our evening's event, Criminal Prosecution, Innovation, and Reform. I'm Kate Mogulescu. I'm a clinical professor here at Brooklyn Law School. Uh, last year, I launched the Criminal Defense and Advocacy Clinic here, which is Brooklyn's first in-house defender clinic. This, together with uh, Dean Stacy Kaplow and Professor Jocelyn Simonson, I co-direct the Center for Criminal Justice, um, which is sponsoring tonight's event. The Center for Criminal Just Justice launched in 2016, and it really is the hub for activity, advocacy, research, scholarship, um, on the criminal legal system here at Brooklyn Law School. In addition to putting on events, the, um, the center awards student fellowships and postgraduate fellowships to Brooklyn Law alum who are working in public interest in criminal justice in largely defender and prosecutor organizations. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome tonight's panelists. Um, I'm going to introduce them briefly uh, along with the moderator and then turn it over to them for tonight's program. Uh, Starting all the way to my right, to your left, is Nitin Savor. Nitin is the Executive Assistant District Attorney for Strategic Initiatives at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. He is also the Deputy Chief of the Trial Division in charge of criminal court, a position he's held since September 2010, and he oversees all of the criminal court practice for the Manhattan DA's office. Um, in his bio on the website, this number is fixed at 60,000 cases a year, uh, but I think this is something we're going to explore and look into tonight. Um, as an aside, I think that Nitin may be very excited that I am only doing the introductions tonight and not moderating or sitting on the panel, as he might actually get an opportunity to say what he thinks and what the DA's office is doing, rather than, as has been the case for the many years that we've worked together, what I think the DA's office should be doing and thinking. Um, Next to Nitin is Nicole Zayas Fortier. Nicole is the Advocacy and Policy Counsel for the ACLU's Campaign for Smart Justice. This campaign is a national effort to advance state legislative and policy initiatives to end mass incarceration and to reduce uh, racial disparities in the criminal legal system in the US. Next to Nicole is Meg Reese. Meg Reese is the Chief of Social Justice at the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Um, where she is, an office she returned to, is Nick reacting to the title? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> One of the questions we may explore tonight is what does that mean? Um, this is an office she returned to very recently after running the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. One of her charges um, in this role is making sure that the Brooklyn DA's office pursues non-jail dispositions um, in as many cases as possible. And she's also designing a community justice initiative uh, where the office, I think, is trying to reframe the ways that in which they might meet community needs. And I'm sure we'll hear about that tonight. And finally, to my immediate right, Nick Turner is president and director of the Vera Institute of Justice. Uh, Nick's experience and advocacy uh, in the world of criminal justice are absolutely unmatched. Uh, there's far too many things for a brief intro, so I'm not even going to attempt. Uh, Nick directs Vera's work in the areas of police accountability, in reducing incarceration and detention, and conditions of confinement. And um, we are absolutely thrilled to have Nick here and all the panelists here tonight. And I am going to turn it over to Nick Turner now. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. John Legend here. Lately, I've joined the fight to end mass incarceration, and I've been meeting with many important figures involved with the criminal justice system across the country. But there is one group I want to talk about today, district attorneys. Within a single role, they have the power to decide who gets criminal charges filed against them, the severity of those charges, or if charges get filed at all. And this covers everything from theft, drug crime, environmental crime, violent crimes, and more severe cases such as rape or murder. These are the responsibilities of your district attorney. Your initial reaction might be that justice is being fairly served. But understand that despite state and federal laws, the influential power they carry allows them to prioritize or deprioritize how those laws are enforced and who they are enforced against. They literally have the power to send people to prison for life and send people to death row. Armed burglary by a teen is a crime, but the DA decides whether that young person is thrown away or treated through rehabilitation. 
In a single decision, free from accountability, DAs can funnel people into the prison system, trapping them in the revolving door of mass incarceration. Equally so, they can give them a second chance. These DAs represent our voice, but most of our DAs' actions don't represent what we believe. Let's take a look at Proposition 47, which reduced the penalties for certain nonviolent offenses. In California, the majority voted to pass the proposition, but only two of the 58 district attorneys at the time agreed. With all the power the DA holds, they can operate in a bubble, and if not aligned with the people, can undermine the winning proposition. When no one is watching, there is no accountability. The district attorney is an elected position which represents your interest in the criminal justice system. It's up to you to hold them accountable, which starts by getting to know them. The power you have starts with just saying, hey. So how many of you have seen that before? So, uh, so I thought that that was a great way for us to, to, to get started. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable video that was actually uh, put together by the ACLU of Northern California uh, uh, in 2017 in order to gear up for the elections in every county in California and try to engage uh, the voters in paying attention to local elections, to the elections of, of uh, district attorneys, which it turns out most people don't really do. Um, the thing that I want to say to you as, before we jump in is that uh, this film made in 2017, uh, nothing like that has really ever been made before. It is, a, it is a function of the moment we're in and the kind of attention that is on prosecutors right now. Um, it is ahistorical, um, and we're going to spend some time talking about well, why that's so, uh, why this moment for, uh, for uh, prosecution and the role that prosecutors should play in, in justice reform um, is special, why there's euphoria in, in the, the room. Uh, well, maybe not in this room. This does not <laughs> look like euphoria, people. I'll just say that. Um, but by the end of the evening, it will, I'm sure. Um, but why there is euphoria in the space and, and, and whether it's right for us to, to, to um, expect uh, the delivery of justice reform from prosecutors. So we're going to cover all of that ground. Uh, let me just start out with a, with a few things uh, uh, quickly to say that um, first, the, what we're going to do, we have, um, it is 6.20, I believe we are going to 7.30, so we're going to talk a bit maybe until about, I don't know, 6.50, 6.55, and then open up for broader discussion with, with the audience. As a moderator, I will um, be obnoxiously energetic. I've warned uh, my, my colleagues here on the panel so that we'll keep things moving. Um, and so if you say something, or if Nicole says something that I think will be really interesting that I want to hear Meg uh, jump in on. I'm going to ask her to do that. So I'm asking you guys again to to uh, to accept my apologies in in advance. Um, and uh, and then really what I want to do after we get to six six fifty or so is to to be able to turn things over to you all for questions. And then just to, as a brief reminder, I'll ask you to ask questions um, less in the way of statements. We want to make sure that we have a lot of dialogue um, in in the room. So let me just begin by saying that on some level, it is great to have this conversation about uh, the, the, the promise and possibility of, of prosecutorial reform here in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, in many respects, I think of uh, the late Ken Thompson, as, uh, who was DA in Brooklyn, elected in 2013, as perhaps the first person <laughs> who really ran for office um, t saying that he wanted to address uh, racial disparities and mass incarceration, that he branded himself a reform prosecutor. Um, Nitin could make the argument, and it actually might be plausible that Cy Vance, his boss, um, did, uh, 
something similarly. I think maybe he didn't brand himself with a capital B, but he was very clear um, in, his, in his election, I think back in 2009 or so, that one of the things that he wanted to do, to do was to address racial disparities in, in prosecution, and that if elected, he would, he would study them carefully and, and try to address them. Um, but so we're talking about a, a moment in uh, American prosecution that is really quite recent. Um, and uh, you can think, think about the 2016 elections. While I'm sure uh, most people in this room were trying to gather themselves and figure out how on earth we elected Donald Trump as president, one of the things that happened all across the country uh, was that, that reform prosecutors were, were elected in Corpus Christi, Texas, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in, uh, in um, St. Louis, uh, in various jurisdictions in California, in Silicon Valley. Um, and, uh, and part of what generated that was a, at that point sort of a little noticed uh, movement on the part of some advocacy groups to start to invest in, in prosecutor elections. Um, and it, it has it since became clearer that the Open Society Foundations, that George Soros put a lot of money into the election of prosecutors, recognizing, in fact, everything that, that, uh, that John Legend said, that these are offices of incredible power, um, the ability to accept or decline cases from the police. Uh, they've got the ability to make recommendations that can be heard by the judge. Um, uh, to affect whether, whether someone should be held on bail or released on recognizance, um, uh, the ability to uh, plea, uh, offer up pleas or to dismiss cases, um, and then, of course, sentencing recommendations. Um, and all of that power is held in an office uh, that is run by an elected official, the, and here's where some of the tensions are that, that exist, and again, our buddy John Legend talked a little bit about it. Um, where there is no real public accountability other than, hey, you elected me and I'm going to have to run again in four years. Um, there is not uh, anything in the way of uniform data reporting uh, that is required of the prosecutor's office. Um, there is no uh, transparency requirement. Um, and uh, it is very hard for us to see into what we call the black box of prosecution. Um, that is quite different than for other institutional players in the criminal justice system, where there, where, uh, there are reporting requirements, where there is a greater degree of, of transparency. I'm not saying that it's perfect in these other places, but in prosecution it is really, um, um, it, it really is lacking. So it raises the question of, uh, if we are counting on prosecutors to take this great power that they have and we are electing them and hoping that they are going to lead their offices to do good things to advance justice and fairness and equal justice, how do we know they're doing it um, when we can't see inside? Uh, how do we know they're doing it when they're not accountable to the public, they're not having to produce um, an annual report that shows the number of cases that they took in, um, which ones they declined, what kinds of plea offers were made, if, if the median sentence for Rob II for a white person was, gener was in the aggregate different than it was for a black person. So how do we know that this kind of reform that we expect um, can be provided by what I will describe, and I don't, this sounds more judgment, well, okay, it is judgmental, but <laughs> than it is that by a generally unaccountable, non-transparent entity um, that has incredible power that also um, isn't necessarily practiced in the art of reform, meaning that we have, it, let's go back to Ken Thompson, it wasn't really until five years ago that we were expecting uh, and electing people to deliver reform. So that means that these are institutions that for many years were doing what they did as they wished to do without a ton of public engagement. So that's the big context. And I guess what I would love, love to do is just to get us started. Nit, and I'm gonna ask you if you don't, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, whether you represent a reform prosecutor office and uh, if so or if not, explain why. 
Sure. And just to go back for a second, I've been in the Manhattan DA's office for 19 years. I, I was hired back in 1999 by the legendary Robert Morgenthau. And when he, was, when he told us at age 90 that he was not going to run again, and this was, this was uh, right before the election in 2009, everyone in the office wanted to know, wow, who is going to take over this job? Right? So we were following the election very closely. And Cy Vance, who I never knew before, I listened to him campaign. And he talked about how his priorities were on reforms in the criminal justice system. He talked about racial disparities in the criminal justice system. He actually made a campaign pledge that he will allow an outside organization to come into the DA's office, look at our books, figure out if there's disparities there so we can address them. Right? But that was his campaign pledge. And then he got elected in 2010. I've been working for him for the last nine years every day. And I see everything he's done to try to reform the criminal justice system. So the answer is yes, he is a reformer. And I have you know, a bunch of different initiatives we've done over the years to try to show you, you know, why that is the case. Do you want to say, give us two examples. Sure. When we started in 2010, right, and he put me in charge of the criminal court, we had about 110,000 cases would come in every year in criminal court. Manhattan is so small, but yet it's one of the busiest criminal courts in the country. And out of those 110,000 cases, almost 90,000 of them would be misdemeanors and violation cases, the low-level cases. The additional 20,000 would be the, the more serious felonies. But we went from 90,000 misdemeanor and violation cases in 2009. As a result of that, our ADA had exorbitant caseloads, 300, 400 cases. I was supervising people who had 425 open cases, which you really can't do justice when you have that much of a caseload. They were always assigned. This year, after nine years of different reform measures, we're probably going to end up this year with about 43,000 misdemeanor and violation cases, 43,000, right? Cutting that number in half. And how you do that is by deciding, should we be prosecuting all these cases that come in? Should our criminal justice system be reactive or should be proactive? If we're reacted, reactive, we're just going to take whatever cases the NYPD gives to us. We're going to make sure that there was probable cause and we're going to prosecute them. But if you're reactive and you decide what cases you want to prosecute, what cases you don't want to prosecute, that's how you can chip away at those numbers. And then we've cut that number in half since we started. Thank you. Meg, how about you? Uh, you've been now in the county of Kings for just three, a, three months. Three months. So <laughs> do you represent a reform uh, DA? And if so, why, why not? So I come with a little bias to the word reform because my prior um, position at John Jay was working with prosecutors from across the country. And reform had a lot of elastic in it. And so there were prosecutors that were definitely not reform-minded, that caused, caused, called themselves reform-minded because they maybe did like one diversion program for pettit larceny and you were allowed to go to that shopper class or something. So I, try, I, I think the language that um, our office has used a lot and that I've heard the DA use is about being progressive and trying to move forward and have progress in prosecution and criminal justice. So I would say that Eric Gonzalez definitely is um, trying to create that. I think Brooklyn has a long history, starting with Joe Hines. Um, and has, as it was mentioned, I started my career in the Brooklyn DA's office under Joe Hines. And he had amazing ideas and implemented. And many of the things that he did then, we are, are looking at again and, and making them modern and doing, you know. But the, so I think Brooklyn, um, and Nick, you probably know this also, offices tend to have a DNA, sort of, of a progressive DNA, um, not just in New York, but across the country. If the history has been that, the offices tend to move in that direction. Um, but going back to where we are in the present, I think um, Eric Gonzalez is progressive, and I think one of the most progressive things that he did, and it sort of addresses the lack of accountability that prosecutors can definitely take advantage of, is, and, and Nick was, um, part of this committee and led a committee is instead of having a transition team, he created 
um, he created his initiative was Justice 2020. And it was essentially made up of, I don't know, 18 committees, 18 different subject matter committees, but it was made up of various stakeholders outside the criminal justice system, but working in this arena. And I think it was, it's really a telltale sign of what's to come. It was, certainly it was prosecutors from the office. It was head of Vera. Um, it was Nick. It was advocates, organizers, directly impacted people, victims, um, judges, defense attorneys. I, I think that's sort of, that was basically the, the stakeholders involved and they were in subject matter areas and really designed key initiatives that they thought should be the district attorney's agenda. And from the 90 plus um, recommendations that came back, it was distilled down into 17 and that will be published very soon to the public and will be the DA's report card of what he plans to achieve over the course of the next year and a half until 2020 when he's up for re-election. Every one of these initiatives, absent maybe one or two, are substantive change. Really, really changing the complexion of how prosecution is done. And I think the biggest change, and I think the way that Justice 2020 was created is really a foreshadowing of the DA's vision of how he thinks justice should be done in Brooklyn which is no longer, it's not sufficient really to be slowly in the district attorney's discretion about how to handle cases and deal with cases, that we're not, we can only do so much of decarceration and not sending people to jail or prison. We can only not charge certain crimes as much, but we really need to move to a model where we're restoring, restoring people to community, and we don't have that skill set. So it really is, and, and probably you've all heard this many, many times, this idea of co-producing safety, but that's what we need. We need different partners besides NYPD and some other law enforcement partners. We need community-based organizations. We need um, different, we need social workers. We need a different mindset to join, so join this I, party. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So Nicole, I want to ask you to just jump in on this. You know. Uh, um, here, Nitin talked about this sort of massive uh, reduction uh, uh, proactively generated by the DA's office to say that they wouldn't take all these violations and these low-level things, that that has resulted in this fairly substantial shrinking of people coming through criminal court. Um, Meg talks about Justice 2020 and this open, engaged process with fine people like me and others to think about <laughs> what the DA's office should do and the co-production of safety. Is that what you have in mind as, as someone who works with a campaign for smart justice at the ACLU? Is that what uh, innovative, progressive reform, I mean, I find all of those well, the terms, labels very right? difficult, but is, <laughs> is that what you're, are you like, yep, that's exactly what we want? What I think, I mean, we're clear what we want at the end of the day, at the Campaign for Smart Justice, we want a 50% reduction in jails and prisons across the country, and we want to see racial disparities that are so extreme to go away. That's what we want. We want the impact. And we are willing to force that impact through the work that we do in the courts, in, in Capitol Hill, um, with voter education, with John Legend, usually. Um, but we also, we, we want to be a partner. We want to go through that progress. We recognize that innovative uh, prosecution, in my opinion, is, the, is sort of the scientific method of figuring out how to do it, right? Prosecutors haven't been in this space for a long time. They haven't been sticking to decarceration goals and racial disparity goals. They've actually been quite the opposite in the previous decades. And so this is new space. And we recognize it, it takes a bit of a scientific method to figure out what it is. But we are not satisfied, if that's your question, until we see the impact and that we see that it's working and that we constantly check ourselves to make sure that things don't change over time. If one policy today is a problem and you deal with that and you deal with it really well, much like Cy Vance did in cutting that in half, always make sure you're still checking so that it doesn't pop up in a different way. Sometimes your policies have to evolve. 
So here, just to play devil's advocate a little bit and to, to get into it. So give, a, give us an example of, of how, you say you partner, maybe you uh, litigate. Or so with prosecutors, how are you trying to move the needle with prosecutors? And if you're interested in a 50% reduction, Nitten talked about a 50% reduction in the number of cases in criminal court, but not all those people were going to be incarcerated. So one could argue, hey, come on, man, that's like low-hanging fruit. It is clearly better that those people are not receiving violations, but they're not going to Rikers. They're not going to state. So you're not getting that. So how, how are you all pushing to get prosecutors to do that kind of heavy-duty work? Well, I, I think our, our prosecutorial initiative is a multi-year effort that we've really taken on because we've identified prosecutors as a driver of incarceration. Uh, our goal focuses on jails and prisons specifically, one of our goals, that is, focuses on jails and prisons specifically, but we recognize the different drivers that bring people there. So even the things that come after reentry or the decisions made really early on in the case are all going to factor into that overall goal. But prosecutors are, in my opinion, the local official that has the most power but the least amount of accountability. And they hold a lot of responsibility in what our mass incarceration system looks like today from decades ago. So those who are in power today have the opportunity to reverse that, not just stop the growth, but reverse it, bring it back down. And so we really work to confront those who are abusing powers, who continue to use tough on crime rhetoric and policies and push it every day, call out the prosecutors who take one initiative and call themselves a reformer, um, educate voters so they better understand that prosecutors, much like Know Your DA in, in California, so that voters understand the extent of prosecutorial power and start asking for accountability on that front. And we work in, in legislation and and work to pass laws that also hone in on, on that accountability front, on defining what that power should look like, and on encouraging reformers who do come into office that they can do it, and they can share their information. We can get that into other prosecutors' offices. We can help you and be your partner in disseminating good practices. But again, I wanna say finding a good practice and a good policy doesn't necessarily mean you've reached the end of the road. The end of the road is always checking. It's having only reformers in the offices, having decarceration goals, having racial disparity goals, and always checking to make sure you're actively working towards it. Nitin, you want to jump in? Yeah. I have to give kudos to the Vera Institute, and I'll tell you why. The blueprint of why we did what we did came from Vera coming into our office in 2012, and we partnered with them, and we, did, we had them do a racial disparity study of our office. And people within my office said, are you crazy? Why are you doing that? You're gonna let some third party organization come in, look at our books, and they're gonna publish a report, they're gonna put it on their website, it's not just gonna be private for us. And our DA said, yes, if I'm gonna try to address the issues in our criminal justice system, I need to know where they exist. So Vera spent almost two years in our office analyzing a, a data set of 212,000 cases over a two-year period. And their results were so helpful for us because guess what? They found racial disparities. They found disparities in different discretion points in the prosecutor's office. Right? And it was helpful for us because we learned from their results what we needed to do to address those disparities. Right? And so they looked at our case acceptance numbers, they looked at our pretrial de detention stats, they looked at our, our dismissal rates, they looked at our plea offers and our sentencing offers, and where they found disparity, we kind of knew, okay, this is where we need to work on to try to reduce this. So but here, so I have a question, so here, this is interesting. So that is, that's true, um, and, and then you talked, Nitin, about this, you know, your the, the big drop in criminal court volume. Your office has also been uh, criticized for not doing enough. And I guess what I'm just trying to figure out here is like, what's, what's enough? At what point 
um, you know, Nicole, will you say, yeah, great, Meg, Justice, you know, uh, Brooklyn 2020, thank you for that, co-producing, safety, thank you for that. We want to see something, and, and, and what's, what's fair here? Yeah, well, I think, to your point, I think that was an amazing effort that both Vera and your office undertook, but I don't know that we want organizations who only have so much capacity to be able to do that. I think we want voters to be able to do that themselves. And as monumental and as much impact came from that, wouldn't it be better if voters themselves had that raw data, if they could see what decisions were being made and when they were being made? I agree with that. And, and that's why there is a effort right now in our office to put our data on our public website, right? So, so people, researchers, the public can see what the stats are. They can see how many dismissals we had this month. They can actually massage the data and do analysis themselves. So you don't need Vera to come in and spend two years and a lot of time and effort to, to run those numbers. Okay. That so. one, that's impressive. <laughs> can I no, that, that would be, I mean, lots of public agencies have opened up their data to, you know, to, and then, and then use, and then invited folks who are data scientists to create lots. I mean, I, this happened a lot in sort of the transportation context. That would be mm -hmm. a very novel thing to release your raw data, I think, so that people could play with it, as opposed to, you know, here's how it's, how it's framed. So that's right. great. Meg, you were about to. Well, I was just, to that point, I think Kim Fox in Chicago right. yes. actually released her data. And then they even brought people in to train them about how to use the data so that they could learn things from the work that people was doing. So um, I think that's great. Um, what I was going to comment on, just a, couple, just a couple of things to vote to mm -hmm. in the conversation is um, that the, um, to your point of the voters, and one of the initiatives that we're undertaking in Brooklyn is what we're calling community-based accountability and trying to develop neighborhood safety partnerships. And it's, it's really working with, and not directly, but working with organizers and advocates in Brooklyn to, um, with the communities most impacted by the criminal justice system, and we're prioritizing communities that are impacted by violence. And um, with these organizers, get developing focus groups, both of community members and then identity-based focus groups of young black men, LGBT, LGBTQIA, um, clergy, victims, and with that information, have getting their definitions of safety and wellness for their communities. And then we're trying to translate that back into our policies and practices to drive how we handle certain cases coming into the office whether we decline to prosecute or how we, what outcomes come from that. But it's not just going to be related to public safety. It's going to be how can we engage using the two powers that the prosecutor's office has, both discretion and ability to convene, both the relationship that the police department has in those communities, in those neighborhoods, um, and also looking at businesses and other social services and housing and Department of Education. And how do we, again, if we're trying to restore people back to community, how do we work as sort of reforming the different systems that are in place in a neighborhood to make an environment that is safe and well? I just on the metric point is when communities do make those recommendations, it will be translated into policies and practice that will have metrics attached that will be disclosed to the public so they can see one that it's been implemented and two whether or not it's working and um, and then if it is. That's great, and constantly trying to evolve. And if it's not, then how do we regroup? Nitin, can I ask you a question? I mean, you said that you've, so you've been at this, I mean, this particular uh, work of, of reform for not nine years. Did I, I, did I get that right? I mean, yeah. one of the things I was going to ask you is like. Uh, last eight years. So what, what is, what's, what's hardest about it? I mean, the, art, the articulation, the, the persuading of ADAs, the hiring of, of young ADAs who have a different mindset about what the job is, middle management that's ossified and is never going to agree with the reform agenda. Um, you know, cult, like what, what actually is really hard about driving 
this kind of change in a prosecutor's office? First, there's internal struggles and hardships, and then there's external, right? So let me give you an example of an external struggle. When looking at disparities, we realized that predominantly 90% of the people who get arrested for jumping a turnstile, theft of services, are black or brown people. And we would get 10,000 fair beat arrests a year, 10,000, right? So we decided that we no longer wanted to prosecute fair beat cases, absent some public safety reason to do so. Right? We didn't think that 10,000 people should get arrested for jumping a turnstile. We thought that they should get a C summons instead. So we think that's a good policy to have. What's very difficult is there's five DAs in New York City, but there's one police department. And the police department, they want a universal or a uniform policy throughout the city. They don't like to have different policies in different counties. So we spent almost six months to a year in trying to talk the NYPD into accepting this, 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 this policy and working with us. And, and eventually they did. They, you know, but it's difficult mm -hmm. because it's not so easy to just, if you want to collaborate with the other stakeholders in the criminal justice system, you have to spend time talking to them. You have to show them why you think it works. You have to give them data. You have to show them that it's not going to affect public safety. You know, the sky's not going to fall down if we're not prosecuting, you know, fair beaters. Right? And so that takes time. So that's an obstacle, right? Internally, initially when we started these different diversion programs, like pre-arraignment diversion, we had to get the buy-in from our own line assistants, our own ADAs that had not really thought about criminal justice reform. You know, we were focused on arrest and prosecution. But then the DA said, look, that's not our sole, that's not our role as law enforcement, just to arrest and prosecute people. You know, our jobs are also to prevent crimes from happening. Our jobs are to, to ensure public safety, and you can do that by actually helping people avoid being entangled in the criminal justice system. So it was, it, was a, it was a different philosophy that we had to adopt in the office because you have a bunch of, you know, you have 600 lawyers, a lot of them are old timers, and they were used to the, 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 the prosecution model, which is let's just prosecute people and, and, and try to sentence them. Not thinking about things like pre-arraignment diversion and no plea diversion where we're dismissing cases people successfully complete a program, right? So it took a while to get the people in the office, their buy-in, and how we did that was by doing a pilot, doing a program, telling people in the office we're doing it, and showing them the results, and showing them that, that this, this actually didn't impact public safety in a negative way. In fact, it, it impacted public safety in, in, a, in a positive way. So that, that takes some time. That's helpful. Um, Nicole, I'm going to ask, ask you a, a question about, about patients. You began by talking about you, you want to see 50% reduction in incarceration. On some level, I'm listening to Nitin, and I'm like, that's, you know, I mean, I run an organization. It is not, doesn't have 600 lawyers. I know how hard it is to change an organization's culture and to get people to do different things. And it requires persuasion and uh, money and a new kind of sort of human capacity. So, so you know, part of me is like, well, I get that. Like that's that's hard. That's hard stuff. But I would imagine that you would say, sorry, like you got to go f faster. So, w uh, talk to me a little bit about the kind of patience that those of us who are on the outside of that business ought to have for. Um, these complicated agencies uh, to change? That's a great question because I think, you know, I, I got into this world because this has impacted my own life and my own family. And so there's a part of me that says, I don't have any patience. I'm sorry. I don't feel bad that it's hard to change a policy and to hire people who can do that. Um, the realist in me understands it's not that simple. So I'm torn, for sure. Uh, just feel the need to name that before anything else. Um, but I also think that sometimes things can be more simple if you simply push hard for ambitious goals. So I appreciate and, and recognize 
your, your Faravader example, right? But my head goes to, so what's the public safety reason and exception, right? Why isn't it just not prosecuted anymore? Why aren't we figuring out a way to deal with that? Because it doesn't seem obvious to me that jumping a turnstile means that somebody's going to be violent and, and affect public safety broadly. The other part of me is like, great, what about everything else? Like, we need to aim high, and if you're going to be changing your culture, you need to be changing your culture. You know what I mean? Like, you, you have to aim really high because you're not gonna land where you aim. You're gonna land somewhere a little bit less. So honing in on one really small policy that's a low-hanging fruit that is going to require so much effort to convince your office around, yeah, that's a good first step, but maybe that's not enough. Maybe we need to be pushing it further. Maybe we need to be thinking about genuine impact at the end of the day. And this is where I said innovative prosecution is a little different, right? Innovative prosecution, in my opinion, is that scientific method. And that's necessary. You have to figure out what works, what doesn't work, test it, have a pilot project. But once you start to do that, let's see more. So I, I love that Faravader's uh, prosecutions have gone down so much and that the police are so on board now. And I think that Sidance has done an amazing job doing that. But is that by itself enough? And no. the fact that we're prosecuting any of them still, is that a problem? I think it is. Right. But Meg, I want to get you in on this. So you're, you know, you've got uh, big am ambitions. What has been surprising to you three months into <laughs> Kings County DA's office? And I've known you for a while, yeah, so yeah. I know that, I mean, you're sincere about your am yep. ambitions. You're very clear about, I mean, your title, which is an awesome title, <laughs> is, is well-deserved. What, um, what's been surprising to you about uh, uh, implementing the vision that Eric hired you to, to implement? What, what has been surprising in terms of the difficulty or what you perceive the difficulties to be or or what's been easy? Um, so the whole reason I came back is because I wanted to actually see how the intersection of the policy work and the actual on the ground. Um, the whole thing has been surprising, which sounds like a pretty naive uh, comment, but it is, um, it's overwhelming what it takes to make change, not just internally, as Nitin said, and changing the but externally, the expectations from other partners. Um, there's, there's expectations from the courts, the, the little things like the court officers, which I'm not saying court officers, that's a little thing, but just changing that dynamic um, of how people are, are treated is each thing has a place. So, I'm not being specific enough, oh, but just to get to, um, I, I think there are things that are surprising. Um, I'll bring up an example that we talked about earlier. There's surprising things with the defense bar as well. Like we know, we've talked about all the things in our office. We know culture. We have all those, all of these issues. One of the things that's surprising that I think I didn't expect as much is with the defense bar because, in an adversarial system, um, which we have but we need to really get away from if we're gonna to try to restore people back to community. Um, it is difficult to have an adversarial system and be able to achieve those goals because a lot of times defense counsel is focused on the immediate exposure and minimizing that, and that's their job, and rather than looking at the long-term exposure and the, the um, minimizing that risk. And there's, that's where we, there's hitting, butting heads there. I think that um, so. What's an example? What's a, I'm trying to think. An about example is of somebody. So, um, an example is of a 17-year-old that had two domestic violence cases: one misdemeanor, one felony. The the felony, the complainant, same complainant on both, um, was not cooperative, and the 17-year-old ended up with a misdemeanor in a program. The program that he got, he didn't show up to, but he ended up going to a community-based program that for whatever reason, he connected with the director of that program. He gets picked up on a warrant, he gets brought back, he's in jail, and defense counsel is asking for 30 days. And it the 17-year-old the said, I wanna stay in this program. The program's connected to probation. 
but for whatever reason there was a connection there. And it was just a weird circumstance of where he, we were ha very happy with him staying in that program because there was a connection that he, a program he voluntarily went to and defense counsel was doing their job and saying, you know what, I'm gonna minimize that exposure because connecting him to probation for a year and being in this program, there's greater risk. But we know that 30 days in jail, he's definitely not coming out better after 30 days, and he's probably not going to get the services and support that he needs, and whatever mentoring might have been going on between him and this director seemed valuable. And that's just where, that's just one example of where there is a clash. Um, I think the other thing that's really challenging internally is, if you have a conviction, whether it is a misdemeanor or a felony, it is, your life is hard. We know that, right? That's the universal truth, but that is our system. And so we talk about incarceration, and obviously, you know, we, we moving from that, and that's, you know, but ending up with any type of conviction really limits your possibilities altogether. And I think we really have to start wrapping our head around what do we do about that? I, it's, uh, as promised, it's 6.55, so I wanted to be able to open up um, to the audience for questions. So I think we have microphones. I see Professor Capers over here, so maybe we can turn to him and then. I'm not trying even need a mic. Uh, <laughs> so, so, a great panel. This is so enjoyable. So, you talk a lot about buy-in from ADAs, a little bit about buy-in from defense counsel. Um, but one thing you haven't talked about is buy-in from the public. I mean, the public has been in the background of everything you've been saying and transparency, but uh, historically, maybe outside of New York, but historically around the country, people want prosecutors to have on crime. So, can you speak a little bit about getting buy-in from the Can I, can I jump in? Please, yeah. Uh, so interestingly, I think a lot of people continue to think that that is the case, but we've done some polling in the last few years, and uh, likely voters in particular uh, are really interested in criminal justice reform. And I think that's why we're seeing this moment right now with prosecutors and having conversations about them, because if 80% to 90% of your constituents want reform. They want to see less disparities in the system, and they have recognized and acknowledged it's too big overall. Then you need to do something about that. Uh, our role at the ACLU and the Campaign for Smart Justice is continuing to help the public understand the system at large, especially focusing on prosecutors, their roles, their power, how it's affecting mass incarceration, because I think the public at this point isn't confused about the problem, they just don't know the solutions. So we're trying to shine a light on that. And I think that this election day really showed us that they care. I mean, uh, John Cruzeau in, in Dallas made a commitment to reduce uh, incarceration by 15 to 20% in his first term, and he won. And that's amazing. And he's committed to, to submit a written plan on how in the first 90 days, so we're excited to see the transparency that will come from that and the accountability. Our role now went from voter education around that campaign to accountability coaches, really. And, and, and I think that that's important that now that they care about the issue, they also have to think about how they play a role in it, and it's voting primarily. I think communication, to that question, Professor, I think communication is key because what we do in our office is anytime we're thinking of a new policy, we have a community partnerships unit and we send them out to the community. They go to community boards, they speak to parents associations, they speak to tenant boards, and they kind of let them know what we're thinking about next. And they hear, you know, pros and cons. Not everyone likes what we want to do. When we decided you know, on August 1st, that we're no longer going to prosecute marijuana possession cases. A lot of people said, hey, we don't want pot smokers in our, in our backyards and stuff like that, in our, in our parks. So we want them prosecuted. But at the end of the day, as long as you give people an opportunity to be heard, you might not agree with them. But I think the majority do want criminal justice reform. Meg, anything that you want to add, or should we go to the next? No, you can go to the next. I mean, Professor Simonson. Hello. So yes, I'm uh, Professor Jocelyn Simonson, and if we could ask when people are asking questions to start off by introducing themselves, I think that can be helpful also. Um, so uh, my question follows up on Professor Capers. That's why I so strenuously wanted to go next. 
um, uh, thinking about public engagement and public accountability. And it's kind of a meta question because we have someone in a court watched NYC t-shirt right here. Um, but, uh, and also uh, for what it's worth, there are a couple of students uh, in the room who in connection with a pro bono project have been working with the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund and doing some court watching. And so I want to ask about uh, broadly about grassroots uh, sort of bottom up pressure uh, toward reform and toward decarceration and the role that plays uh, and not just uh, sort of voting in, in community for a, uh, and then more specifically as an example of it, although I sort of welcome thoughts about other kinds of grassroots pressure um, from the, you know, from people in the neighborhoods who are most impacted by mass incarceration. Uh, and more specifically, I'm wondering um, uh, from, uh, you know, especially from the DA point of view, uh, what it's felt like or what your thoughts are about uh, more recent efforts to do court watching and to sit inside of courtrooms that have always been public, uh, but what's gone on in there hasn't always been uh, public knowledge. I say this, I was a public defender for five years. Uh, people weren't uh, coming into the courtrooms uh, for low-level cases. They were coming to courtrooms, uh, you know, for, for infamous cases. And so I'm curious um, what your thoughts are in the office about the fact that now in a lot of boroughs, I think in both of your boroughs, uh, there are court watchers in the lot, if not all arraignment shifts, who are writing down what happens. And sometimes they're tweeting about it. And sometimes uh, your offices are responding to those tweets. Um, I think that happened with some bail policy. Um, I, I believe uh, uh, Vance's office said that they were gonna stop requesting bail in uh, turnstile jumping cases, and then bail was requested. And there was a tweet about it from Court Watch. And then what happened? A supervisor from your office responded and said, no, here's, here's why we did that in that case. And there was sort of this immediate accountability. And so I would love to hear thoughts on that. So, so I'll take the second question first. I think it's excellent. I think it, it draws attention to an example if that wasn't the case. But a lot of times it draws attention to things that you think might have changed and didn't and you can put in practices to try to affect that change. I think what happened with court watchers in Brooklyn, this is before my time, but <clears throat> it, saying that, you know, when policy was passed and people were still asking for bail, where the DA implemented a policy of having people, anytime you ask for bail, you have to report it. And we get reports and all of the executives go through them every day. So even where bail was set, but the judge, even where bail was requested, but the judge didn't set it, that is reviewed, you have to give your explanation for why. And he reads those, we all read them, but he reads them every night and often when he'll, he'll challenge if somebody did ask for bail, questioning why they did and understanding if there's more information. I think there are a few, th I think with RFK, their bailout, I think that was really interesting in moving the ball forward. I think all of these external prods, for lack of a better word, are excellent because it brings attention to things that maybe you just don't, necessarily see yourselves. I think the, the more light, the better. Um, going on to the community piece, for our office, that's a critical part of the DA's agenda, is literally getting the community's voice into designing our policies and practices, especially the communities most impacted. And I, I think when you talk about community, it's, it's a, or the public, it's such a big question, like as we're trying to figure out where we do these focus groups, we're trying to get down to neighborhood levels of just blocks because they change so rapidly, and we're literally doing it by looking at where the data is and figuring out what that community is. And then hopefully, we're not having those, we will not be having those conversations directly at first because people don't want to sit with the DA's office. But we're hoping we'll have the, the goodwill of organizers and advocates that are in Brooklyn to facilitate that. Newton, you have a quick one on this, and then we're yeah. going to keep the questions when, going. When we implement the new policy in our office, we have that memorialized and we send that policy out to the heads of all the public defenders and the 18B panel because we want it to be transparent. We want the, the defense bar to know what our policies are so they can make sure that we, we follow them, right? And so organizations like Court Watch who sit in the courtroom, I think they pay, play such an important role in, in making sure that prosecutors do what they say they're gonna do. And we've had experiences where, you know, one assistant mistakenly, you know, wrote up a case that should have been dismissed, it should have been uh, declined to be prosecuted. And, and it was a court watcher who brought to our attention and we immediately dismissed it. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a valuable thing to have someone there making sure that we're following our own rules. Thank you. Where's the microphone? Hi, 
My name is Emerald, I'm a student here. Um, in full fairness, this question comes from my best friend who is not here tonight, but she works as a public defender for the Appellate Division in Manhattan. Um, and her question is twofold. The first one is, at what point does a staff ADA start seeing the opportunity to exercise more discretion in their cases? And the second question is, which factors are especially important to a prosecutor when exercising discretion on what to charge the accused with? The first, first part was at what point do prosecutors use discretion or are they entitled to use their discretion? Uh, no, I, I think the question was specifically to start to see an opportunity to exercise. How early on in that process does that happen? So our prosecutors are fresh out of, you know, they just graduated law school in, in May or June and we put them in training from September to probably about mid-October and then we train them you know, in the court parts and, and starting the, the weekend after Thanksgiving, they're working in these court parts by themselves. But they're not that experienced. So we have to give them some guidance. So we give them plea guidelines and we tell them, because we're, we're very concerned that, that everyone is treated the same way. We don't want disparities, right? So we give them plea guidelines and we tell them, this is what we kind of expect you to do. However, these guidelines are not chiseled in stone. If you think there's a reason to detract from that, you should speak to a supervisor because you're brand new, you've only been doing this job for a few months, speak to a supervisor and we want you to go in there and challenge what the, the guideline is. If you think something else should be offered on the case, go talk to your supervisor and, 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 and get that permission to do that. So right from the get-go, we don't want them to be robots and just follow what's written down on a piece of paper, but we put that there because what we are concerned about is it should never be that in an arraignment one day, one prosecutor is recommending that someone plead the charge on a case, and the next day, another prosecutor is offering violations on that same exact set of facts. So, so the guidelines are important, but we encourage you, we need you to learn how to use your discretion, we need you to learn how to know what a case is worth, and you do that by having conversations with other people in the office that are a little more experienced. Are those guidelines public? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we hand them out to you know, the defense bar. I mean, the defense bar, they know our guidelines even better than we do, but, <laughs> but yes, they, they are. Here, let's go over here. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Mario Coronas. I'm from the uh, Queens District Attorney's Office. Um, I, I'm taking a issue with the fact that so much emphasis is uh, placed on the prosecutor as uh, such an essential player in the criminal justice system. In my opinion, I believe it's the police officer that uh, the whole process starts with the police officer that a person doesn't even get involved in the criminal justice system until an arrest is made. Now, the mayor has the authority to appoint a police commissioner, and in counties outside of uh, New York City, there's elected uh, sheriffs and things of that nature. So I think there should be an emphasis on uh, uh, scrutinizing uh, police uh, officers and uh, their elections as well and their appointments. Actually, my prerogative to, to <laughs> ask a question related to that, which is that, I mean, in thinking about where, where we've heard there's been movement in these prosecutors' offices and, and Nitin's example now of the, the sort of reduction by 50% of misdemeanor and violation cases and the specific example of theft of services, and you said NYPD at the beginning was, was the decline to prosecute theft of services and that NYPD was averse to this notion to begin with. Initially, NYPD and the MTA. Yeah, right. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about what that looked like then and how that negotiation went because there is this question about really who's driving this and where do police fit in and where, where do prosecutors fit in. And then a second question, because I'm a law professor now and I can't ask a question that doesn't have at least six parts to it, um, is so there is, there is a way that this is sort of influencing police conduct, right? These reforms then influence police conduct. So there's a feedback loop there. But what about looking at police conduct generally more, more critically as part of the reform, as part of the innovation. And so thinking about not just, well, we're just categorically not going to prosecute people who, who have the turnstile, but rather we're going to really scrutinize police conduct in cases and think about that. Where does that fit into this? Because that's, I think, an area that might also 
get at a lot of the points that Nicole has made in terms of where the community frustration or community interest might be. So can I take a stab at that? So the first part of your question, uh, let me give you an example, um, using marijuana. Our office historically prosecuted about 8,000 people a year for the B misdemeanor possession of marijuana in the fifth degree. So either you, you, you had a small amount of uh, marijuana that was open to public view or you were smoking it in public, right? 8,000 cases. I think it was D.A. Thompson who in 2014 said that he was going to stop prosecuting the open to public view cases. And as a result of that, the NYPD said, well, we don't want all these DPs that declined to prosecute uh, these stats. So they changed their own policy in, 2000, in November 2014 and said to the police officers, what we'd like to do is we want you to issue C summonses for people that are possessing marijuana open to public view. Still arrest the people that are smoking in public, but give criminal court summonses. Don't arrest for those that were just possessing it. So our arrest numbers, our prosecutions went from 8,000 down to about four to 5,000, right? So last year, we prosecuted about four to 5,000 people that were smoking in public. Our DA realized that, that there's a big racial disparity as to who gets arrested for smoking in public. 90% of the people that we were prosecuting were black or brown. So we sat down with the NYPD and we showed them the data. We showed them the, 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 the stats that we had and we said, look, we would really encourage you to do what you were doing with the, the open to public view, giving C summonses. We're not saying that people should be able to walk around smoking weed in public, but, but make the punishment proportionate to what they're actually doing. And treat pot smokers the same way you treat people that are holding open containers of beer in public, right? So it was a conversation that took place over six months, right? We also, in the meanwhile, sent out people from our office to travel to, to different states throughout the United States. We did a six month survey on other states that decriminalized marijuana to see what the effects were. So ultimately, we showed the NYPD all this. They still were a little reluctant to change their policy, but we, say, but we, we really focus on extreme collaboration with the NYPD, with the defense bar, with the courts, so we stayed with it. And we said to them, look, starting August 1st, we're gonna start decline to prosecute all these marijuana smokers, unless they're selling, you know, that's the only real exception. So what ultimately happened was the mayor's office and the PD, they changed their position on this. And they, they, they enacted their own policy that went into effect a month later, and now they give C summonses for people who smoke marijuana. So it does, it takes time, it takes a lot of collaboration between the different stakeholders, but at the end of the day, I think they eventually get on board. So let's keep this moving. Let me just say, just to answer your question, which is that there's nothing in this discussion here that is mutually exclusive with the notion of, of police reform. And we've actually lived in an environment where there's been, a, I would say, a more uh, vocal call for police reform than there has been for prosecutorial reform, whether it's around you know, wh whether it's around broken windows policing or quality of life policing, and there's a lot to be said about police over enforcement, but, you know, prosecutors can choose to uh, decline cases that the cops bring them, and then can all the way down the line in the way we saw in the video. So I think that both can exist quite comfortably in the, in the same universe. What are some of the other questions that are, that are out here? Maybe I'm a bit cynical, but it seems to me that if you get Democratic nomination for attorney, you're going to win that nomination no matter what thinks. I mean, you're, you're talking about educating the public, but the fact is, in New York City, the Democratic district attorney will be elected. I mean, I'm not New York City specific. Right. I can talk about I'll national. Say, I mean, Brooklyn had a, it, it will be Democratic, but there can be a lot of real estate in what Democratic is. So Brooklyn had, it was five people in the race in Brooklyn. That's but only when there's no elected district attorney at that point. Same thing right. happened with, well, with, with Vance. It's when the current district attorney does not get the Democratic Support. So Joe Hines and, and Ken Thompson. Democratic support, Joe Hines. And 
that's what through that election. Well, let me just but just he, just to just I mean, you know, let's take California yeah. for example, where where there were. Well, so I'll tell you a little something about California. But where, where there were reform candidates who primaried others, and some won, and some, and, and then some, and then some lost. I'm sorry. Was there an elected district attorney had the party support? No. That's the point I'm trying to make. How about Staten Island? Staten Island is an example. Staten Island. Staten. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you had a you had a Republican <laughs> district attorney in Staten Island. I have a question that I would actually love to ask, that I would love to ask all of you. We're talking about the, you know, the sort of daily um, case management processing work of, of district attorney's offices, but we also know that there's a lot of work that DAs do up in the Capitol, um, and that whenever there's a debate around, uh, you know, whatever, pretrial justice reform or something, that at least certainly the story in, in New York is that the, that the DAs are always lining up against it and using their political power. So when you think of, uh, you know, Nicole, when you think about the smart um, justice work and Nitin and Meg, this is above your pay grade, just say that, that that's so, but think about what it means to be in the kinds of offices that you describe. Do you think that there's a role to be played in focusing on the political power of, of DAs and capitals. Absolutely. I think that uh, DAs associations are extraordinarily powerful, and even individual DAs are so extraordinarily powerful when it comes to pushing through reform, not only inside their offices, but legislation, even nationally. Uh, before this, I worked uh, with a group called Law Enforcement Leaders to Reduce Crime and Incarceration, and the entire concept of the group um, housed in the Brennan Center, was that these guys are powerful. So if they are pro-reform, they shouldn't just be changing their internal policies, they should be advocating for those policies, and they should be working with all of us in getting the reforms that 90% of voters want. And so I, I think that there's an important power, in my opinion, that when I say prosecut pro prosecutorial power broadly, I also mean the power to lobby and the power to push forward legislation and the power to even just lobby inside an association to get it to do it. Um, I think when going back to your original question to me, like when are we satisfied, we're satisfied when that power is transparent as well and being used. Um, I think the word reform is being tossed around a lot when somebody rejects tough on crime rhetoric and policies and instead embraces the idea of ending mass incarceration, but you have to do more than that. You have to act on it, and that may mean outside of your office. In 2012, the, the DAs and the then police chief, Bratton, went up to Albany with the mayor to try to convince the legislature to, to decriminalize the marijuana possession open to public view. They wanted to make the B misdemeanor into a violation. They were unsuccessful, but th that's an example of DAs getting together and going to Albany to try to change the law. Let's get two questions here in quick succession. Ah, okay. So ask your question, and then we're going to get these two, and then we're going to wrap. So. One can be quick. Um, I'm Nicole. I'm with Court Watch, obviously, um, and also the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund. Um, thank you for your question highlighting who we are, which is a community accountability movement putting pressure on the DA, specifically Brooklyn and Manhattan, to follow the stated reforms and to continue to push. And we wouldn't really need to be here if so many of these, um, so, many, so much of this data was public. And I just wanted to follow up on what you were saying about um, data being publicly accessible in the future and then just ask a question about if that, I believe that's been promised in Brooklyn in the past and just the follow-up question being what data would be public available? Is there a plan to do this? And it, like, is there a timeline? And um, just kind of hoping that that information is stuff that isn't already public, publicly available, that it is the things like you were saying, Meg, about um, the re bail requests and things like that. Is it possible for the public to get that info? Okay, thanks. And then we'll just get the other two questions on the table as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hiram Bell. I'm a court attorney in Supreme Court. I used to be the supervising attorney for Brooklyn Criminal Court and Staten Island Criminal Court. 
Um, both of Manhattan and Brooklyn have community courts. Um, is there any effort to, especially since I know more about Brooklyn than I do Manhattan, is there anything to, you know, I guess, to expand community courts like in maybe East New York, Brownsville, or other areas? Because it definitely has had an impact in Red Hook. Second question is there are about, I guess, I think there are about 12 states that have, will allow the defendant who has had a criminal record, especially usually on misdemeanors, to, if they, I guess, have been clean for like five or a period of time, to have their record eliminated. You know, obviously they go before some type of probation board who then can make the recommendation. Is there any effort for that in New York? Thank you. And then last, and then last question. Did you have a question? Um, I have a question. What's your name? Oh, right. Um, Alexandra Jane. I'm a student here. I have a question about what Nicole was alluding to about the loopholes that are implied in the um, decrease of the marijuana and um, fair evasion um, prosecutions, that there is always going to be a loophole. And I um, wanted to connect that to the two reforms that have passed in California in the last month or two about um, bail and uh, the felony murder rule that were heavily um, not supported by the DAs in the, that state and uh, whether either of those things would happen here anytime soon or um, if they would always have to have some sort of loophole implied in them the same way they had there and then also um, relative to like Philadelphia and Larry Krasner and the someone was alluding to the fact that there's a movement up in the system of DAs that they're always going to have worked as DAs before whereas Larry Krasner came as a public defense like public defense attorney and he really eliminated any loophole period what he put out in February I wanted to ask about if anything like that has any chance of coming into being here and his release of the do not call list in the last week or two okay. kind of speaks Sorry. to that. Sorry, so that's like that, That's questions. like a 12 part question. You follow your professor very well. Um, so so um, Meg, I'm gonna ask you, so here's what we're gonna do. We have like eight minutes left. So this is gonna be speed answering. Meg, okay. if you could just like talk about the community yeah. courts expansion and, and expungement possibilities. Yeah. Um, and then, Nitin, if you want to just say more, if you can possibly say about when the data that you all have will be made more public. And, and then, Not Nicole, you can handle me. the 25 part question. <laughs> I don't know that I can, but I, I will. Can, you try. better. I and you better, do it in, you better do it in 30 seconds. Okay. I'll then, do it in 30 and seconds. And then, what we're going to do is we're going to close, just ask you guys just to offer a quick 30 second close on where you hope to be a, a year from now. Like, what would a successful year look like in each of your roles? But, so. <laughs> That's a, um, so as far as community, your question about community courts, I don't know, anyway, we're thinking about it all. I'm not, I'm not sure per se community courts, although that is in the conversation, could there be something that isn't a court where we could resolve matters in the community that doesn't require it to be a court? So other jurisdictions do certain types of community um, justice centers that are made up of community members. Could it look like that? Could it look like a Red Hook court? So that is that is on the table and that is our discussion. I'm like da da da. And then the other part of um, clearing records, expungement, etc. Yes, that's one of the Justice 2020 initiatives to have a, a process for doing that. There was a push to, to create a second community court in Manhattan, in Upper Manhattan, in Harlem. And, and there was pushback from OCA because to do that, you would then need judges to staff it. You'd need court, you know, court officers, clerks, and, and we have a shortage of that in criminal court. So. Well, I know in, in Midtown, it was mostly devoted to prostitution. And the prostitution at the time when Midtown opened up was street prostitution. Now prostitution has gone computer-wise. So, 
But our youth parts are in Midtown Community Court. Our drug diversion parts are in Midtown Community Court. So we, we utilize it for, other than just arraignments, a lot of our, our pre-arraignment diversion and, and our post-arraignment diversion programs. So Nitin, do you want to tell us, we promise we won't tell anyone else outside of this room, <laughs> when you guys are making your data so, public? Yeah, so we, we've been in the process. We had different iterations of it, but some of it didn't look pleasing for the website. So we are, probably in the next few months, we're going to get something up there so at least people can see some of these metrics that we look at dismissals, trials, you know, bail applications, you know, um, you know, how many, how many, uh, you know, how many uh, cases we, we've, we've dismissed, you know, things like that. And a, a quick comment that I still think Court Watch would have a role in that world because I, I think that that is an extraordinary and necessary step, but accountability still should be coming from, from everywhere. And then, and, and that isn't my turn now. Yes. Good <laughs> the, luck. Okay, so I think, and you can tell me if I'm slightly off, but getting at the loophole aspect, I, I think a lot of this in some ways, back to what I originally said when I first referenced that, is about aiming higher. If, if you're a reformer and you're trying to change things and you're trying to not just stop the growth of mass incarceration but reverse it to cut it in half and to combat racial disparities, then you need to aim high. You need to not go for low level uh, offenses only. You need to not go for that low hanging fruit. You need to have tough conversations internally, externally, and with yourself. And I think that the loopholes sometimes exist because people are coming to the table with something that's just a little too low, then negotiating it down even further. Separately, I think part of the reality of all of this is that on a practical side, I, I get to sit in, in a great ivory tower, right? And I talk about policy and how ideal it could be. I recognize that on a practical level, negotiations exist. Talking to people who are really concerned about public safety exists. And you have to acknowledge and, and figure out a way to make people feel comfortable. So a lot of those things that you know that you, you called loopholes really quickly also come from that practical negotiation process. Um, I think the solution is always remembering the goal. The goal, in my opinion, and it's certainly the campaign's opinion, is decarceration and combating racial disparities. And if you're not ultimately doing that, if you're so honed in on conviction rates or how many people um, are no longer being prosecuted for this offense versus this offense, you're going to miss things. You need to be thinking about that goal at all times, analyzing all of it, and letting people be able to also help you do that analysis. Put that data out there. And that's how you slowly get at those loopholes. And it also means we all have a part to play in educating each other, in, in helping one another recognize that reform is necessary and that's not just a talking point. We need to start talking specifics. I hope that gets at your Thank many you. questions. So, Nitin, why don't you start us out? Where, Thirty seconds. Where do you? What does success look like for you over the course of the next year? You come back here. Uh, the, uh, you're invited for another panel. What's what's going to be different? And then let's just go down the line. Reducing racial disparities. Reducing disparities. Other types of disparities within our office as well. These are two of our, our goals. We also want to, to propose or work on bail reform because we think our bail statute is outdated and needs some reform work. And we just want to continue to maintain the fairness in our criminal court and really ensure that only the more serious cases get prosecuted in criminal court. All the low-level stuff we should be working with the NYPD and working with other stakeholders to make sure those people get diverted in some shape or form. I think in, in one year's time, that's so short, but I want to see reformers not just saying that they're reformers. I want to see the action behind it, that innovative practice, and I want to see the impact. I want to see less people in jails and prisons, I want to see less racial disparities and anything less than I'm going to be in your face. So I would say all of those things um, that I guess the, if we're talking a year's time, that our office has made progress on flipping the presumption of prosecution, which is the 
um, <coughs> Nick's panel, which is that incarceration is the exception and everything else is the default, and having our community, our neighborhood safety partnerships set up that are helping advise us on what our policies and practices in the office should be as far as driving safety in their communities. Those would be the two big things. Professor Simonson and the rest of the audience, thanks very much for having us, and a round of applause for our wonderful panelists.